Welcome to the final day of the 2012 American Society of Human Genetics meeting. It's been a joy for me all week. I hope it has been equally for you. Yesterday, we had the great pleasure to hear two distinguished colleagues present their seminal contributions to human genetics. Doug Wallace, winner of the Genetics Award from the Gruber Foundation, and Uta Franca, winner of the William Allen Award from our society. <clears throat> this morning, we honor human geneticists who have distinguished themselves on behalf of our field and our society. These awards address critical priorities for ASHG, advances in genetics education, leadership in the genetics community, outstanding research of graduate uh, research of their graduate students and of postdocs, and remarkable work in the first decade of a research career in human genetics. Our first award is for Excellence in Genetics Education, presented this year to Alan Emery, Emeritus Professor of Human Genetics at University of Edinburgh. Professor Emery cannot travel and has instead sent us a video and a splendid colleague to introduce it. Presenting the award to Professor Emery, is Professor Dame K. Davies, Dr. Lee's Professor of Anatomy at Oxford University and a member of our ASHG board. Professor Davies is also Director of the MRC Functional Genetics Unit, a Governor of the Wellcome Trust, a Director of the Oxford Center for Gene Function, and a Dame Commander of the British Empire. K. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very sorry that Alan Emery can't be here today, but he was too ill to travel, but I assure you he is getting better, and you'll see that from the video uh, at the end. So it's with great pleasure that I introduced Alan as the recipient of the AHHG Award of Excellence to Human Genetic Education of the Society. I've known Alan Emery personally as a close friend and colleague for more than 30 years because of our mutual interest in the muscular dystrophies. Alan has had a distinguished career as an academic, a scientist, an author, an artist, and an educator. Alan grew up in Manchester where, from a humble background, he won a scholarship to Manchester Grammar School. Following military service, he got his first degree from the University of Manchester, but this wasn't in medicine, but in botany and zoology. And his first paper was an article on the Rose Bay willow herb, which was published in Nature in 1954. After a short spell as a science teacher, he changed directions to start ma ma medicine at Manchester University and again qualified with a first-class degree with honours and distinction. After house jobs, Alan won a fellowship at John Hopkins University to study with Victor McCusick. It was there that Alan first became interested in the muscular dystrophies. His first medical paper was on the manifesting female carriers of Duchenne muscular dystrophy, and this was eventually to become the subject of his PhD in 1964. During that spell in the United States, he described a new form of muscular dystrophy known as Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. Recently, the gene for this condition was identified, and Alan has the unique honor of having both the disease and the gene Emerin named after him. Alan returned from John Hopkins and founded one of the first departments of medical genetics in the UK in his old university at Manchester. It was a very small department, and he set up a, a, a small course, and then eventually moved to Edinburgh University to set up yet another department of medical genetics. At this time, there was a great deal of interest in genetics in Edinburgh, with a new MRC chromosome unit and strong molecular genetics lab led by Ed Sutton. Alan showed that medical genetics department could not only do clinical research, but could also provide a clinical service. It's remarkable that Alan has published over 400 peer-reviewed papers which have made a significant contribution to many areas of genetic research and 26 books. He has received many national and international awards and honorary degrees. For example, he was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award from the World Federation of Neurology and most recently the 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award from the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign of Great Britain. As an author, Alan has brought prestigious. He has written many specialist monographs and textbooks. Professor Emery's textbooks, Elements of Medical Genetics, has been a world leader for many years and is now in its 14th edition. It has been the main undergraduate textbook in the UK. It's a pleasure to see generations of medical students learning about medical genetics from this source. 
Once, when his publisher Churchill Livingston was carrying out their market research, they sent a form to Allen, and amongst their questions asked was about any competition for his book. Is there any competition for your book, Allen, they wrote. His answer was no competition. This was not arrogance, but the truth. The book has been translated into Italian, Greek, Spanish, Arabic, French, Chinese, and serbo croat Alan Magnus, Alan's magnus omus with the late David Royne, Principles and Practice of Medical Genetics, is a real tour de force. It has also proved very popular and run to several editions. This work and his several other genetically orientated books will be well known to members of the society, and I'm not going to list them all. Alan has also written books for the layman, including families affected by muscular dystrophy. His little book, published by OUP, his, his book on muscular dystrophy, The Facts, is a bestseller and again has been translated into several languages. But Alan's impact has extended far beyond the academic and scientific writings and lectures. He's also done an outstanding biography and fas in fascinating detail of Edward Merriam and his Hoganite origins, which brought his forebears to England and who gave very lucid descriptions of Duchenne muscular dystrophy many years ahead of Duchenne. He's also an accomplished artist and has produced a number of books in relation to medicine and art and other specialties such as surgery and pediatrics. He's also been a popular speaker on this subject, both to medical audiences and more recently in a public lecture at the National Gallery in London. He's also published several books of poetry. Of course, in addition to writing books, Alan has played an important role as an educator and a mentor. When Alan started in Edinburgh, there was only one lecture on clinical genetics for the medical students, but Alan saw this as the most important lecture of the year. Because of his, the way he's an excellent speaker and always produces scintillating lectures with remarkable clarity and humor. By conveying his enthusiasm for the subject, he aimed to inspire one student each year to take an interest in genetics. In reality, there were many students who, ins who were inspired by his enthusiasm, and some went on to set up genetics departments of their own throughout the world, and I'm sure some of those are in the audience today. We're now going to play a video uh, which uh, amateur Kay Davis film producer took. Alan insisted on having this done in the garden at Green College in Oxford, so I apologize for the slight uh, interruptions by the wind. But I think you'll see this is true Alan Emery. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great tribute to receive this award from the American Society of Human Genetics. And I'm just so very sorry I can't receive it in person because I so look forward to coming to the United States and seeing some of my old friends from Johns Hopkins Day. And of course, visiting the States, because this is where my career in medical genetics really began. So I thought perhaps I might start there. I went to medical school after military service. So when I completed my training and done my residences, I was in my mid-30s, which is a little bit old to start into one of the specialties. So I had a word with the head of the department. He suggested genetics. Now this seemed a million miles from us at the time, because though Watson and Crick had reported their DNA study in 1953, in Britain at that time we had big problems facing us, such as malnutrition because we'd had uh, rationing, food rationing right through the war and it went on to the end of the 50s, very poor housing because of bombing, and of course many infectious diseases. Anyway. I understood this might be a good experiment to go and I got a fellowship and I went to Hopkins to work with McCusick and this was wonderful because he was so encouraging but unfortunately his interests were in Marfan syndrome where he was a world authority and also in dwarfism whereas my interests were more in neurology. So I had a word with the head of neurology at Hopkins, Professor McGladdery from Canada and he said why not muscular dystrophy? Well, I'd barely heard the word, so he gave me some books to read and some reprints, and I set about studying them over a week or two. And I got quite excited because there seemed a lot of unanswered questions. So I went back and told him, yes, I thought this would be a wonderful project. So he said, well, now I'll give you the notes of two families. You can start by seeing these boys, first of all, because this was Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Well, 
the first family lived in a beautiful suburb of Baltimore, and the boys were well cared for. There were two brothers, one was ten and one was eight. They had a swimming pool, the parents were delightful, and the whole family was very close, and the boys were obviously well looked after and had lunch. And I was feeling quite positive about the whole thing. And then I went downtown to the second family, to one of these high-rise frats, and went up these stairs to the top and knocked on the door, and the door opened on its own, and I thought, that's very odd. And there's a piece of string attached to the door knob, and at the end of the string was this little boy sitting in a wheelchair and pulled it to open the door. Because he was all on his own when his mother left for work in the morning and didn't come back until the evening. He left all his meals on the table and the television turned on. And that was his life. I never ever forgot that at all. Because you see, the problem was that you don't realise when you work in a laboratory or in a hospital. You don't see these patients. You don't see what they're going to be like when uh, they're affected in their homes and their home environment. And this is so very, very important. And that was a rule and an experience that stayed with me for the rest of my working life. Anyway, cut a long story short, I, I uh, decided that I'd go on doing muscular dystrophy under McCusick and looking for families with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And one of the ones, one of these families had been reported was by uh, Dr. Dreyfus of Charlottesville and his uh, postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Hogan. And this was a very large family. And clearly it didn't look like Duchenne to me because the proband, several of them had had children. So I decided to study it if I could. And I wrote to uh, Dr. Dreyfus and he was very helpful. He said, well, his interest was epilepsy. In fact, he became a world authority on epilepsy. Uh, but he said, if you'd like to go, that would be wonderful. And you, you can do under my, whatever you wish to do when you get there. So I arranged to see the family. And in those days, you could do everything yourself. You didn't need a big team. And so I put in the back of the car a spectrophotometer so I could measure creatine kinase levels when I got there. And a, and a cardiography machine so I could do cardiograms. Uh, blood sampling so I could do the XG blood group because we knew that was on the X chromosome. And color vision plates because we knew that uh, color vision was uh, also on the X chromosome. And if we're going to do linkage, it was very important to know these things. So I set off and I drove the thousand kilometers south of Baltimore to Charlottesville and up in the mountains in Tennessee. It's a beautiful part of America. And when I arrived there, I was met by the pro band. It was a middle-aged school teacher. I thought, though, this isn't Duchenne. Anyway, we had a wonderful evening together and uh, he, um, he was very interested in folk music. So was I, and he'd recorded quite a lot. And I was very intrigued by some of the music he played, which was about Queen Bess. And he really believed that his family had descended from the first people, Walter Raleigh, who landed in America before anyone else. And Queen Bess, of course, was Elizabeth. We had a wonderful evening, and it was made better by drinking lots of bourbon. But the following morning, oh, that's when I started. And I worked very hard all day doing these ECGs, measuring creatine kinase levels. Went on late into the night. And then on the Sunday morning, after they came out of church, I saw the rest of the family. I got all the information I needed, and I drove back to Baltimore. And this information all went to my thesis. I didn't think much about it at the time. But of course, later, it was clear that this was a, a unique disease, uh, and they gave it the eponym Emery Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. But then, you see, in 1964, after I'd done my PhD, I had to go back to Britain, and I set up a medical genetics department, first in Manchester, and then in 1968 in Edinburgh. But now, as a general physician, as well as specializing in medical genetics, and I had an awful lot of teaching to do, undergraduates on the ward, undergraduates in the outpatient department, as well as postdoctorals. And so my interest in genetics was expanding all the time, and when I was just, in 1967, back in Britain, I wrote a little book, encouraged by the University of California Press, called Heredity, Disease and Man. It's been very successful. And uh, when I got back to Britain, I was talking about this, uh, and certainly when I went to Edinburgh in 1968, Church of Livingston decided perhaps it might be a good idea to publish a book for students in Britain, but it had to cost less than a pound. That's $1.50. One can't imagine a textbook now costing $1.50. But it was very important in those days. 
And second, it had, a book, had to be a book that was readable, that students would take into a coffee house or in Scotland into a pub and sit in a corner with a pint of beer and read it. And it worked very well. In fact, we now know that this book, The Elements of Medical Genetics, has been translated into seven languages and it's now in its 14th edition. And last year, it won the BMA Best Student, Best Medical Student uh, textbook. And it has been a huge success. There's just one little anecdote I remember. One of the languages that was translated into was Chinese. And I went to China for the British Council to go visiting hospitals. And when I arrived and went to see the dean, on his desk was a copy of my book. And he was speaking Chinese among his colleagues, but I noticed it was my book because of the logo. But everything else was in Chinese. I learned later that he sold over two million copies, but I never got any royalties. But that's an entirely different story. Anyway, now genetics by the 1980s was expanding enormously. And there was far more to it than just undergraduate training. They wanted a postgraduate book. And so it would cover all aspects of medical genetics. But I didn't feel qualified to cover skeletal dysplasias, dermatology, and so on. And my friend in America, David Ramoyne, said he'd help. So the two of us edited this book in the first edition Principles and Practice of Medical Genetics came out in 1983, and now it's going to come out this year, uh, in 2012, it's going to come out in the sixth edition. Now, some of you will know that David passed away a couple of months ago, and um, the editors of the Principles and Practice wrote to me recently and asked, would I write a little note about David for their foreword? And if I may, I'd like to read you what I said. David and I first met in 1963 when we were both research fellows with Dr. McCusick at Johns Hopkins Hospital. He studied dwarfism and I studied muscular dystrophy. He had an opposite, uh, office opposite mine and we shared many experiences and events together until I graduated PhD in 64 he retur and returned to the UK and David was awarded his PhD a year or two later but we remained very close personal terms thereafter, including a wonderful stay at his home in Beverly Hills when I was Berkman Visiting Professor at UCLA. And on another occasion, we attended a meeting in Moscow before Perestroika and Glasnost, which was very, very challenging at the time. But over the years, we worked very closely together on the PPMG. And on several occasions, he visited Edinburgh where I was then working. And then in 2006, he was invited to give the annual Emory Lecture at Green College, Oxford. And he gave an excellent talk entitled, Skeletal Dysplasias, Clinical and Molecular Correlations. And it was extremely well received. I should miss David greatly, his warmth, generosity and friendship. And of course, his collaboration with the Emory and Ramoyne principles of medical genetics. I'm most grateful to David because I understand now he was one of those who proposed me for this award and also to the society for nominating for this award. I'm most grateful. Thank you very much. It gives me great pleasure, Alan, on behalf of the American Society of Human Genetics to present you with this award for excellence in human genetics education. Well, thank you very much, Kay, and thank you, the American Society of Human Genetics. I'm greatly honoured. Thank you very much. Thanks so very much, Kay. You are you have a future in um, you have a future in filmmaking, but please don't give up your day job. If you allow me one personal anecdote, I was an undergraduate math major at Carleton College and thinking what kind of what kind of applied work that could be of use to people one could do with mathematics and went down to our library one Saturday night and a, a new book had just come in. This was 1965 and it was Professor Emery's Principles of Medical Genetics, a small book. And I just I sat there on the floor of the library, opened this book, read all the way through it. It was absolutely literate. I knew no genetics. It's what brought me 
it brought my interest in genetics to the front of my mind. I had never thought about it before. The capacity to write in a literate way about our field is so important. And I'm sure that my story is one of many such stories of people who were uh, enchanted with medical genetics because of Professor Emery's work.